Boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, are you guys ready to see a magic show? My enthusiastic young companions are about to bake a cake. Riley, raise their hand to give me a good ingredient for our cake. Flour, sure, throw some flour in there. Oh, wait, great, 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 thank you very much. And it's, of course, a magic cake. Two, and wait a second, three. Oh, gee whiz, gee whiz. Oh. It came from nowhere. Then there's the even more awesome magic bag. I'm gonna put it into the magic bag. Now, on the count of three. What's the magic word again? And there you go, How did that happen? Excuse me, would you, would you help me, sir? Me? Yeah, sure, would you? Can you help me, please? Yeah, sure, All come right, on, I'll help me with it. Now what's happening? Come on over here. Step right over here. There's this big man going up on stage. Uh, stay right here. Now they're putting the magician in the box. They're really sealing him in tight. Now, you're going to hold the magic curtain. Hold it. Wave the magic curtain. Wait, like that? Yep. Now, wave the magic curtain and raise it up above your head. Is that high enough? A little higher up above your head. How's that? Wonderful. And there you go. Liam the Magician is also a Harvard psychologist. After his shows, he asks kids from the audience to explain what they've seen. I see. How does seven-year-old Dana think the magician got out of the box? I don't know. Was it, you think that anybody could do that? No. Just him? Yep. What, and what, what makes him able to do it? Because he's magic. He's magic? What, how, no, wait a minute. What, what about Daniel the bird? is three. Why would the balloon change into the bird? Because he's, that's magic. That's magic. Oh, it is, huh? That's pretty neat. Magic. For psychologists, it's a perfect way to explore the young and developing mind. At the University of Illinois, psychologist Carl Rosengren is finding out where this idea of magic comes from in the first place. There's that red book. Parents are asked to watch a videotaped magic show with their children. <gasps> While Carl watches them watching. What's Dean gonna do with this now? His basic conclusion? Go? Parents provide special explanations for extraordinary people and events. Uh, look! He changed them, didn't he? He did magic again. Parents do sort of build up all of these stories about fantastic people, people that can do all sorts of things, tooth fairies, Santa Claus, uh, magicians, who have special powers that differentiate themselves from other individuals in our culture. And without the parents sort of providing some support for that, it's unlikely that the child is going to come up with these kinds of explanations entirely on their own. But there's more to magic than just parental suggestion. Kids have to be ready to believe. He didn't get small, he's still big. This experiment uses an impressive looking machine to change the size of things. This is a special kind of machine. This machine's gonna try to make Terry small. Do you think the machine can make Terry small? No? I'm gonna put Terry right here. And then we'll see if we can make the room in Terry small, okay? Let's say bye bye to Terry. Bye bye, Terry. Okay, let's go back in the other room. To add atmosphere, Electronic sounds are played. Do you think the room's going to be big, or do you think it's going to be small? Small. Should we go see it? OK, let's go see it. Come on. OK. Come on, Dad. Let's go find Terry. Can you find Terry? Where's Terry? He was in the room. Look in the middle. Is there Terry? You see Terry? Really? Far from being amazed at this magic event, three-year-old Andrew goes straight to the shrunken room as if nothing had happened. Do you think the machine made it small? To them, this is a machine just like a TV or a VCR that can be remote con remotely controlled or like a remote gar uh, garage door opener. And it's, a, it's a new machine that can do this thing, and they might be surprised the first time but very quickly, they sort of accept this as something within the realm of possibility. Let's see it. Consistently, three- and four-year-olds accept that the machine changes the size of the room. They have not yet had enough experience with the world to know that such a thing is not only novel, but probably not even possible. Let's go find 
find Terry. Let's go find Terry. Where's Terry? There, there he is. It made it big. One of the important things that children um, must learn is what kinds of things are typical or possible in the world. And until the child sort of differentiates those things that are possible from those things that are not, in a sense, there's no room for magic. Just down the hall from Carl, Renee Bayer-Jones right, finding out when that sense of the possible begins to develop. Renee's group puts on magic shows for babies with results that have astonished her colleagues around the world. Each show tests whether babies know some basic physical rule, that objects can't just disappear, for example. If babies have the knowledge, they will be puzzled or surprised or intrigued by our magical events. And we know when babies are surprised or puzzled, they tend to scrutinize the events, to look and look and look at them. And so what we do in our experiments is compare infants' responses to magical events and non-magical or real events to see whether they look longer at the magical than at the real ones. As Holly's attention is captured, a hidden observer starts the timer. This time, it's a non-magical, normal event. The three-month-old is soon bored. She looks away, and the clock is stopped. Now for the impossible or magical event. Holly stares. She really scrutinizes the event. That means she's surprised. Even at three months, she knows the world doesn't work this way. Backstage, there's a simple explanation. Two dolls moved independently. But Holly is riveted and even startled by such an illogical sight. Over many trials, three-month-olds have been consistently surprised by the disappearing doll trick. They all seem to understand it's not possible. But take a look at the next result. Babies like Felix, who were just two weeks older, were not surprised. Renee concluded that their worldview was more sophisticated. These babies spontaneously came to the conclusion that we were using two different objects, two minis, to produce the event. And so what we did to test this interpretation was to lower the screen at the start of each event. We say, mm -mm, no, this is not what's going on here. Okay, he thinks, I see they've got just one doll up there. But unknown to Felix, when the arch is raised, the second doll is slipped back in. And once again, these slightly older babies were back to being surprised, which seems to confirm Renee's conclusion that they had figured out the original trick. In the box experiment, Renee's been testing what babies know about falling. Three-month-olds, like Holly, don't find the non-magical event interesting. They soon look away. But in the magical variation... That's much more interesting, really worth staring at. So it seems that by three months, babies have learned that unsupported things should fall. But once again, there was a twist to the story. Slightly older babies usually weren't upset when the box just hung in midair. Now it was the researchers' turn to be surprised. 
we were very, very puzzled by that result. And it actually took us weeks and weeks and months of thinking through what could be going on and trying all kinds of different hypotheses until finally one day we came to this idea that, my goodness, what if they thought that somehow the finger, which was the only thing in contact with the box, had become attached to it? And that's why they weren't surprised. They were generating an explanation, in this case an incorrect one, but a, a sort of relatively plausible one for the box's failure to fall. To test this explanation, they changed the trick so that the finger lost contact with the box. And sure enough, the babies were once again startled by the sight. It is absolutely remarkable that such little babies, when shown our surprising events, you know, are actively thinking about what we show them and actively searching for and finding explanations for what they see. I think it really gives us a fascinating insight into what babies are doing when they look at the world around them. Thank you. So if babies can be so logical, how can kids believe in magic? The answer seems to be that around the age of five or six, there are still gaps in children's knowledge of the physical world. We'll get you out of there one sec. They're prepared to fill those gaps with a sort of catch-all explanation. He is in there. <laughs> it must be magic. But by age seven, a firm sense of reality has set in. How did I get into the box? Um, there was a hole over here, um, you opened it. Yeah? Because there was a hole. A hole, oh, a hole in the box. A hole in the box. I saw that trick before, but I forget how it's done. Oh, oh it's mean... a trick. Oh, uh, I know how. Wow. When you waved it up, he must have opened the box and you switched places. What? In fact, it's not until we're much older that we allow ourselves to suspend our hard-won beliefs. and just enjoy the show. <laughs>